Warming from anthropogenic emissions is expected to have a long-term impact on the climate system, ranging from rise in sea levels, hot extremes and droughts, heavy precipitation and flooding, loss of ecosystems, to the threat of extinction for some species. Human populations will likely face widespread and cross-cutting risks to health, water supply, food security, and livelihood, impacting socioeconomic development, political stability, and human security at large. These emissions have contributed to a one degree Celsius rise in temperature from pre-industrial levels to this date. Under the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, countries across the globe committed to undertake mitigation measures that would limit global warming to under two degrees Celsius. These measures will require extensive transitions in our energy, transport, water, food, industrial, and infrastructure systems starting now. This requires deep decarbonization supported by innovative technologies, increased financial investment, and strong policy frameworks. All strategies will rely on some form of carbon dioxide removal that would lead to a 45% decline in global CO2 emissions by 2030 compared to 2010 levels, and that would achieve net zero emissions by 2050. For this to work, not only do we need to limit emissions, we also need to remove what we've already emitted from the atmosphere. Traditionally, carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration systems, or CCUS, have been employed at point sources, like power plants, with the potential to reduce CO2 emissions by 80 to 90 percent. The captured CO2 is then either stored in geological formations or put to use in enhanced oil and gas recovery or to make products like baking soda and hydrochloric acid for industrial and commercial applications. A new suite of technologies has also been gaining traction, negative emissions technologies, or NETs. NETs remove already emitted CO2 from the environment. NETs range from traditional techniques like afforestation to newer methods like enhanced weathering of soil, increasing ocean alkalinity, or direct air capture. Based on some estimates, CCUS systems and NETs together have the potential to mitigate a majority of our climate uncertainties. Why have we been unsuccessful so far? Traditional CCUS systems that employ geological storage are often regarded as unsafe given the risk of CO2 leakage. Also, the typical source to sink distances make it difficult to monetize CCUS in the long run. Nets, on the other hand, are not mature enough for us to be certain that they can independently achieve our climate targets. Nets have yet to overcome significant technological and economic barriers before they can be successfully deployed at scale, and even then, the environmental and ethical consequences of some nets are largely unknown to us. Climate action needs to happen now, but what will it take for us to make it? Is carbon management the panacea, or is it just hype? Our panel of experts will further discuss the future of carbon management in tonight's Energy Symposium. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of Houston and for our second installation of this year's uh, Energy Symposium series, where our, theory of our theme for this year is Critical Issues in Energy. Uh, tonight's topic, as we just heard, is carbon management. Is it hype or panacea? And I'm Tracy Hester. I'm a lecturer at the University of Houston Law Center, where I teach environmental law classes and have been working on issues related to deep decarbonization and direct air capture from a legal perspective. It's my great pleasure to introduce all of you here tonight and thank you for joining us and braving the Arctic temperatures outside. <laughs> uh, it is my pleasure to introduce everyone and then speedily get out of the way so they can uh, bring the uh, fascinating discussion to you. Uh, our panel is excellent and uh, I'd like to give thanks to every one of them participating tonight. Uh, but of course, like the Academy Awards, that's not the only thank you. I uh, have a couple of other folks I want to make sure we thank as well. In particular, I want to thank Houston Public Media. Uh, they have helped spread the word about tonight's event and helped guarantee such a large turnout for us. We always appreciate working in partnership with them to raise visibility on important issues. I also want to recognize the President's Energy Advisory Board. Uh, the board is made of industry experts 
and leaders who give UH and UH Energy strategic guidance to help us advance energy education and research. It's one of the great advantages of being the uh, energy university and the energy capital of the world. Uh, we have an enormous well of expertise and talent to tap to help us uh, chart the right course. Also want to thank our UH Energy Fellows who are on our faculty. They contributed to these symposiums and uh, I know that at least a couple of you are out in the audience tonight. Uh, is, uh, they are also participating in other programs and events throughout the year. And last and certainly not least, I want to thank our student volunteers. Uh, they're the ones who help actually get things done and uh, help uh, provide some of the manpower and uh, energy to get things accomplished. Uh, as well as, and my notes don't say this, but I want to make sure we also thank the staff who always make this sure this happens. I'm looking in the back of the room making sure that they feel deeply appreciated. So with that, uh, a few quick notes about tonight's event. First of all, I uh, wanted to let you all know that this event is being streamcasted onto the internet live on the UH Energy Facebook. Uh, we'll also have a video of the panel available for viewing after uh, by YouTube by Thursday. So uh, if you are interested in participating in the discussion and submit questions, I wanted to let you know that you can submit them online at the link that is currently on the screen. And uh, we will try as much as we can to consolidate questions and get them to our, uh, our speakers in a way that you uh, can try and at least capture the most important issues all of you want to hear about. Uh, this link will show up periodically during the course of the program, so you don't need to frantically scribble it down now, but uh, if you can, keep in mind that you can do that during the presentations. We like audience engagement, so not only your questions, we also encourage you to participate in our quiz. Uh, we will take two breaks to provide quizzes that you can uh, essentially provide your feedback on some of the issues we're going to talk about. And uh, my understanding is that uh, there are prizes for the winners. Uh, I'm not sure because I never ever win the quiz. Uh, and tonight I'm disqualified from it. So. so without any further delay, I'd like to introduce our moderator. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Romani Webb. She's an associate research scholar at Columbia Law School and she's senior fellow at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. Uh, her research explores legal and policy tools to minimize the climate impacts of energy development, and she's addressed topics such as the regulation of the energy sector's greenhouse gas emissions under US federal and state law, federal and state approaches to supporting clean energy development, and legal and policy issues related to carbon capture and sequestration. As always, the, uh, the brief bio never really captures the true justice of a person, I can also tell you just from personal experience that Romani is one of the most respected scholars in the country. She does excellent work in the energy sphere, and it truly is a great privilege, and, and I'm happy to have her here join us tonight. So with that, the podium is yours. Well, thank you, Tracy, for that very kind introduction, and um, thank you for including me in this event. Tracy did not mention that I spent a few years at what may be classed as the enemy here at UH, um, at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and it is always nice to be back in Texas, um, and it's particularly nice to be here tonight with such our esteemed uh, group of panelists talking about really a topic of such great importance. Um, here we go. Um, so, I think I figured out the clicker. Um, so as many of you will be aware, last month the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC as it's known for short, released a new report that really um, highlights the challenges we face in dealing with climate change. And uh, the report makes clear that in order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we will likely need to rely on those negative emission technologies that the video talked about. Um, but as the video made clear, those technologies come with some risks. So really, uh, tonight's panel is intended to explore both the opportunities and the challenges presented by negative emission technologies. But before we get into that, I want to provide a little bit of background on um, the technologies and, and why we might need them. And I want to start with, I didn't figure out the clicker. I want to start with the findings of the IPCC report. The very first line of the report declares, and I quote, human activities are estimated to have caused approximately one degree Celsius of global warming above pre-industrial levels. So that one degree Celsius is about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Most of that warming, about two thirds of that warming has occurred within the last three decades um, with temperatures increasing at about 0.2 degrees Celsius um, 
per decade. Uh, and that increase in temperatures has corresponded, of course, with a sharp rise in the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, which is released through a variety of human activities. Um, globally, since the 1970s, uh, anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions have increased by about 90%. Um, we have seen some leveling off of emissions in recent years. Um, between about 2014 and 2016, global emissions were relatively stable, and um, that led to a lot of optimism that emissions had finally peaked and we would soon see a decline in emissions. But that didn't prove to be the case, and in 2017, emissions, global emissions again increased. Um, Studies show that if future emissions um, trends follow those of the past and action isn't taken to address climate change, isn't taken to reduce emissions, we're looking at temperature increases of about four to five degrees Celsius or seven to nine degrees Fahrenheit by the end of this century. And a recent report commissioned by the World Bank concluded that temperature increases of that magnitude um, would have serious, potentially devastating risks, um, but really that the full extent of those risks can't be accurately assessed because a four or five degree world is just so different from anything that's been experienced in the past. So scientists have long told us that in order to minimise the risks associated um, with warming, we should aim to limit any temperature increase to around two degrees Celsius. You heard in the video that that was the goal adopted in the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement also included um, a, an additional line that called on parties to take additional steps to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels because it said doing so would significantly reduce the impacts of climate change. And that statement was included uh, primarily at the insistence of small island nations that argued that even if temperatures were limited to two degrees Celsius, the resulting impacts would really threaten their survival. And there is growing evidence that temperature increases of two degrees Celsius are far from safe, as many people have thought. Um, so the IPCC report concluded that there will be a marked increase in climate impacts if temperatures increase by more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. So as we move from 1.5 degrees Celsius to 2 degrees Celsius, we're likely to see um, much more severe and longer lasting heat waves, much more pronounced changes in precipitation patterns, uh, which will lead to more intense droughts and floods. And all of that will have flow on effects on um, natural and human systems. So if you take sea level rise, Going from 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius results in an additional 10 centimetres or about 4 inches of sea level rise, which doesn't really sound like much, but the IPCC estimates would result in an additional 10 million people globally um, being affected by coastal flooding. So in order to limit warming to 1.5 or even 2 degrees Celsius, we are going to need to substantially reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. Um, the IPCC report um, and many other scientific studies have developed what are called emission reduction pathways that reflect um, the reductions we will need to achieve over time in order to limit warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. Um, the 1.5 degree pathways generally require emissions to reach net zero between 2045 and 2055, so really not very far in the future. Um, the two degree pathways give us a little bit more time but still require net um, zero emissions by between 2065 and 2080. Um, all of the pathways assume that we will eventually get to net negative emissions. So this slide shows the 1.5 degree pathways from the, the IPCC report and you can, all, you can see that they all result in net negative emissions um, in the second half of this century. So that means that sometime after 2050 we need to start removing more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than we put into it. And that's where these carbon dioxide removal or negative emission technologies come in. For a long time, uh, carbon dioxide removal or CDR was really seen as sort of a last resort for dealing with climate change. The thinking was that we would deploy CDR once we'd eliminated all anthropogenic emissions and use it to sort of soak up any residual carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But recently, there's been a sort of growing push to use CDR um, in the more immediate term to offset uh, emissions that are difficult or costly to eliminate. So a good example is emissions from the aviation industry, which we know are going to be extremely difficult and extremely high cost to eliminate. 
And so it may end up being more cost effective to use um, CDR to simply offset those emissions. And so using CDR in that way would effectively allow us to continue emitting um, carbon dioxide for longer than we'd otherwise be able to. So in the energy industry, that has big implications um, and could result in us being able to continue using fossil fuels for much longer than we'd otherwise be able to and still achieve the, the climate goals set in the Paris Agreement. So what would it look like to rely on these um, CDR measures? The IPCC report divides measures into kind of four key categories, um, which are on the slide. Basically, uh, they all involve removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it in some way, either in geological formations, um, in terrestrial systems like plants, or in the oceans. Um, but of course, we can also take that captured carbon dioxide um, and convert it into useful products. Uh, so some of our panelists tonight are going to talk about new and emerging technologies that could um, make that happen or allow that to happen. Um, one thing I do want to note, though, is I think it's fair to say that many of those technologies are still very much in development um, and haven't yet been shown to be fully feasible. Even where the technologies are feasible, implementing them at the scale required will present significant challenges and risks. So many of the technologies are quite high cost. Um, some of them require huge amounts of land or impose significant demands on other resources. And so they could negatively affect things like biodiversity and um, food security, as the video mentioned. So, these challenges and risks could, if not adequately addressed, really limit our ability to rely on CDR. Um, but if the challenges and risks can be addressed, then I think CDR holds huge potential. And so that's um, really the issue for our panel tonight. Whether CDR is, is the panacea that can solve all our climate change woes or is really just a pipe dream. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to our panelists now. Um, they're each going to provide some opening remarks and then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, as Tracy said, please submit your questions online. Um, so our first speaker tonight will be Steve Oldham, who is the CEO of Carbon Engineering, a Canada-based company focused on commercializing technologies to capture carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere and synthesize it into transportation fuels. Um, prior to joining Carbon Engineering, Steve worked in various roles in the technology, robotics, and aerospace sectors, and he holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics and computer science from the University of Birmingham in England. Um, after Steve, we will hear from Brock Forrest, who is the senior research and development engineer at Eight Rivers Capital. Um, Brock's work focuses on the design and development of the supercritical carbon dioxide alum cycle. Uh, he was responsible for engineering oversight and procurement for the world's first supercritical CO2 demonstration plant and currently leads the design effort for the world's first commercial scale plant. Um, and he holds a bachelor's degree in environmental, environmental engineering from MIT. Um, and then our final speaker tonight will be B Bill Peacock, who is the Vice President of Research at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Um, Bill directs the foundation's work uh, on the application of free market principles to address issues facing Texas and the nation. His own work focuses on identifying and reducing the harmful effects of regulation on the economy, businesses, and consumers. Um, he has extensive experience in Texas state government and has worked in a number of government departments. And he holds a bachelor's degree in history from the University of North Carolina and an MBA um, from right here at the University of Houston. So I will hand it over to Steve. Is that, that moves Chapel forward. Hill? What's that? Is that UNC Chapel Hill? No. So thank you for uh, inviting me here today. I'm going to speak quickly because I need to get back to Canada so I can warm up. <laughs> so um, uh, Romney covered this first slide for me already. Uh, there's 100 pictures I could have chosen about climate change. The polar bear stuck on the ice flow, the forest fires in, um, in California. I chose the receding glacier. I'm going to take it as red for the purposes of my 10-minute talk here that we understand climate change is a problem and we need to kind of solve it. 
The IPCC report for us had one really significant point, and I've highlighted it on the screen. Romani had the same quote on her, um, on her slide. The fact that now any scenario, all scenarios that restrict um, global warming to 1.5 degrees, all of them require some form of negative emissions. That's a scary, scary thought. The last IPCC report, I think it was five years ago, four years ago, then it was only about 80% of scenarios. Now it's 100%. So we need to start research and development on cost-effective ways to do negative emissions, and we need to start now. Well, the good news is we didn't start now. We didn't start yesterday. At Carbon engineering, we started eight years ago. So we have technology that's working and proving. I'm going to show you some pictures of that. One of the real challenges with climate change is, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about the impacts of the IPCC report, and a lot of people look at it and say, it's, it's overwhelming. What can we do? You know, I, I need to drive my car. I need to drop my kids off at hockey practice or football practice, I guess, here. Um, you know, we still all need to commute. We've got to do work. We've got to fly. I flew here. Uh, lots of people will have used transportation to get here. We all enjoy a traditional good Texas steak, um, but apparently we've all got to stop eating meat. Um, to assist in climate change too. These are overwhelming behavioral changes that are difficult for us all to accept. I always draw an analogy with smoking. You know, smoking was determined by many, many scientific reports to be very, very dangerous. Despite the fact that all these reports said you will potentially die if you smoke, lots and lots of people kept smoking for a very long time. Lots of people still do today. That's fine, that's their choice. It takes a long time for us to modify our behavior, but we don't have a long time. So are the ways in which we can start addressing climate change now without affecting our lifestyle and our behaviors? So uh, the picture you saw in the video is one of our negative emissions plants. DAC, direct air capture, is what we call it. This is a schematic of a, of a plant that, um, that we would build. One of these plants would capture about a million tons of CO2 from the atmosphere directly every year and then it's usable or sequesterable. Um, that is the equivalent of about a quarter of a million cars. More importantly, in my mind, 40 million trees. That's a lot of trees, um, a lot of land area. These plants are relatively small, about 20 acres. Uh, we'll build one of these plants. Because CO2 in the atmosphere is everywhere and uniformly distributed, this plant could be in the center of downtown Houston or it could be in the middle of the Sahara Desert. It's going to have the same impact for collecting CO2 from the air. And that's a big advantage. There are some great economic cases already today for how you can combine climate change mitigation with good, sound economics. Generally speaking, capitalism is a good thing. If there are things that motivate economic behavior, they're going to get implemented. Uh, an example, EOR, enhanced oil recovery. So the EOR here in Texas, the energy capital of the world, there's a lot of use of EOR to generate crude. If you use atmospheric CO2 instead of regular CO2 or CO2 from the ground, now you have crude that is negative emission because you've pumped so much CO2 into the ground, up comes the fossil fuel, but now your net emissions for that process are zero or thereabouts. You have a negative emission crude. So now there is a way in which you can use and implement a good climate change mitigation and continue to use fossil fuel while we give ourselves time as a species to get used to all the changes and the technologies we need to develop to get to zero emissions. Another example, at Carbon Engineering, what we do with the CO2 we capture from the air today is we make a synthetic fuel. The synthetic fuel, you'll see there's a little picture of it there, that is the first recycled fuel in the world. It's made entirely from CO2 captured from your holiday last year when you flew to the Bahamas and your plane emitted CO2. We captured it and we made fuel to power the plane for your next holiday to the Bahamas. And we will continue that cycle. This fuel is completely compatible with every vehicle you saw today when you got here. You can put this fuel in your existing car and it's carbon neutral tomorrow. Now, if you compare that with other forms of decarbonizing transportation, like electric vehicles, electric vehicles undoubtedly have their place as we head long-term towards a uh, carbon-neutral society. Electric vehicles are going to be essential. A huge amount of money. There's a billion cars in the world. At $30,000 for us all to get a new car, that's $30 trillion. 
to decarbonize light transportation. Or if you give us that $30 trillion, we'll probably do the entire emissions of the world. <laughs> this is a, a little video of the plant that we have. We're in Squamish, British Columbia. It's a, it's a beautiful location. This plant's been operating since 2015. We capture today about a ton of CO2 every day. Uh, we're in the process of working on how to scale up our facility to address those uh, challenges that uh, Romani talked about. To be clear, our technology works. It's working full time. It's working on a regular basis. Um, it's a question of how quickly we scale and how many different jurisdictions we build in. The technology we have uses pieces of equipment that are standard in other industries, the cooling tower industry the water treatment industry, the iron ore industry. We've taken equipment from each of those industries, we apply a proprietary chemical process on top of that, and we capture the 400 parts per million of CO2 in the air and turn it into concentrated CO2. At this facility, we then take that CO2, combine it with hydrogen, and make a fuel. If fuel is compatible with jet fuel, you want to decarbonize aviation, electric planes are a long, long way off, why don't you just change the fuel? If you change the fuel and make the fuel carbon neutral, the vehicle is carbon neutral. Our company has been funded 50% by investors, and over, I think it's eight years, we've received about 15 million of government support. That's a small number for the criticality of, uh, of work that this and other technologies are, are doing. Um, I'll finish my remarks with just a, a closing comment on on state of readiness of the industry. Um, the direct air capture industry is an industry that hasn't had a lot of attention. Uh, our approach at Carbon Engineering has been develop the technology first, demonstrate that it's working, work the economics down to a price point where it's affordable, make a product that we all use today, fuel, that everybody has a market for worldwide, and then go to market. So our company has started to go to market this year. We've received an awful lot of interest. It's terrific. Um, and we're looking forward to bringing this technology into the world to solve the problems that Romani and others talked about. And I think that's the closing slot of the video, showing the, uh, the fan that pulls the air in to our machine that uh, captures the CO2. And that's all for me. Thank you. I think we are going to do a Kahoot quiz. Yes? Um, so if you go to kahoot.it, um, you should have a list of questions there. Enter your answers. Make sure you get them right. You could win a drone. Um, <laughs> a drone? That's what I saw on the slide. Yeah. Well, I wish that were true. Oh, okay. Sorry, I got caught What's up that? reading the questions <laughs> that were already coming in. <laughs> so uh, can we have the Kahoot first Kahoot question put up on the screen, please? There it is. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who might not be able to see in the back, the PIN number is 7462087. Oh, wow. And mine. I must appreciate, I appreciate <laughs> everyone putting, you're playing it straight with putting your names in. I've only seen one Pikachu so far. <laughs> All right, we say to be leveling off. Okay. Wait, wait, a few more adding in. I like that one. Mine's just All right. Let's give about another minute or so. Okay. <laughs> As soon as I say it, of course, a few more people dash in. All right. Now, I've never seen it drop before. Okay. Ready? First question coming up. Which greenhouse gas is the most abundant and contributes the most to the greenhouse effect? Water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, or ozone? 
And I can see from the pace that everyone already knows the answer to this question. <laughs> and the answer is water vapor. And John is in the lead. <laughs> Number two, the goal of the Paris Climate Agreement is to keep global warming a below one degree, below two degree, below 2.5 degree, or over one degree centigrade. 66, 74, and answer is B. And most of you nailed that one. John, however, still has the lead. John, John wants his drone. John wants the drone. According to Webb, <laughs> how many fewer people are at risk if sea level rise is reduced to 0.1 million millimeters? 1 million, 5 million, 8 million, or 10 million? And the answer is 10 million, and all, a very large percentage of you got that. <laughs> wow. John, I am very curious to see you at the end of this. Which is not a technological approach considered under the negative emissions technology? Direct air capture, ocean fertilization, <laughs> low battery, solar radiation management, and forestation. A little bit slower on this one. Okay, and the answer is C, and 51 of you got that. And yes, no surprises. Yeah, all right. And last, according to Oldham, how many tons of atmospheric CO2 can one DAC plant capture? 100 tons, 100 million tons, 250 million tons, or 1 billion tons? And the answer is B, 100 million tons. Is it John? Oh! John, I'm so sorry. All right, thank you for playing. We will be doing another round after our next two presentations. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Uh, I am here, um, thankfully, because you're here, and I appreciate your attention. Um, I'm here to talk to you about net power. I work for a company called Eight Rivers. I'm the senior R&D engineer, but I also am the lead uh, engineer in designing our commercial facility as well as our demonstration facility uh, for net power which is actually located 35 minutes away from here in Laporte, Texas. So it is a first of a kind direct fired oxy fuel supercritical carbon, di carbon dioxide cycle and I'll talk about that a little bit as well as the future we see for that technology and how we address climate change and collaborate with uh, other low carbon technologies around the world. So for perspective, that's the facility we recently constructed down in Laporte, Texas. It's a 50 megawatt uh, thermal plant. Um, it is industrial scale, and as far as I'm aware, it is the largest supercritical CO2 power facility in the world of any kind. I'm very proud to have been part of that project. So what is net power? Well, net power is in a mouthful, a high pressure, supercritical, oxy fuel, recuperated Brayton cycle that uses carbon dioxide as a working fluid. Uh, why does that matter? Well, it means we can burn fossil fuels directly, and on the back end of the facility, what, what we have from a mass balance perspective is CO2 and water, a normally pure stream of CO2 and a relatively clean stream of water. Um, and we're looking to hit efficiencies that are comparable to that of combined cycle systems uh, for the same fuel input. Um, so this has a pretty uh, big benefit in terms of clearly no CO2 emissions, uh, or we're at least able to capture all the emissions. Um, there's no NOx emissions being oxy fuel, uh, given the quality of natural gas that typically exists in the United States and the rest of the developed world, no SOx emissions. So this would be something you could plant uh, right in the middle of uh, Houston, which actually has some pretty strict laws for NOx, uh, because a facility like this doesn't have any of the same environmental concerns. Uh, more importantly is the clearly the climate change aspect of being able to capture all the carbon and manage it in a way that leads to value-added activities uh, from an economic standpoint. So when we look at carbon capture from the net power perspective, we're looking at everything um, like EOR, uh, pure sequestration plays for um, uh, deposition into saline aquifers, but as well as the ability to use that CO2 in value-added chemicals such as methanol, DME, ethanol, uh, and as well as part of kind of the hydrogen economy, which I'll talk about later. 
So as I mentioned earlier, uh, net power is unique in the fact that it is a very different power cycle from what most people are accustomed to in the electricity generation realm. Uh, this is not using steam, it's not using uh, compressed air like you'd see in a conventional combined cycle system or thermal gener generation plant. Um, it is uh, radical in the sense that it operates at approximately 300 bar pressure, so that's gonna be pretty much the highest pressure you'd ever see in, in a power generation facility. The most advanced steam plants are operating around those pressures. We're operating in 1150C, um, so it's, uh, we'll say, old school, E-class type uh, gas turbine technology, but the combination of the two creates a, a radical difference in the power we're able to achieve out of a single turbine. And what we're seeing is that for uh, this power facility, we have the potential to achieve 59% efficiency on a fuel, fuel, uh, fuel input basis uh, with full carbon capture and uh, one turbine. So for those of you who know your power plants, if you wanted a 300 megawatt uh, electric power plant, you've got what's typically an F-class one-on-one -on -one system. So you've got one gas turbine and three steam turbines. Well, this is all being done with one, one turbine. And the reason we're able to do that is because the power density and potential of CO2 is just phenomenal in terms of what it's able to do with turbo machinery. And the picture here is actually a brief diagram of the demonstration plant down in Port Texas. Uh, we finished construction uh, as of December of 2017. And since then, we've been commissioning the plant, running the plant through its paces, uh, proved uh, a 50 megawatt demonstration of the commercial scale combustor, as well as hot operation of the entire plant, and are transitioning to synchronizing with the grid for electrical generation. So as I like to tell my colleagues, we've, we've surmounted Everest, and now we're coming down the backside in terms of the difficulty, and we're all very excited. Um, and this is something in the coming uh, weeks and months, you should hopefully keep your eyes open and you'll see further highlights from this facility. So while we have developed a demonstration plant that successfully is on its way to prove that we can use fossil fuels in a responsible way that captures carbon and allows us to turn that carbon into economic value, we've also been developing our first commercial plants. Um, and I've been leading that effort with my team in Durham and Charlotte and Houston. And what we've been preparing for is actually uh, deployment of 300 megawatt electric plants around the world. Uh, a handful of sites we've been looking at thus far are really focused on areas that see a value to carbon, um, in particular EOR or value-added chemicals, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we are expecting uh, that in 2021, 2022, for the first commercial plant to be up and running. And this is really exciting. So if, if you, you know what 300 megawatts means in terms of the number of houses, depending on where you are in the world, that can be anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000 homes with carbon-free power that is completely stable, it's not beholden to any temperamental environmental conditions, and you are able to use it, um, we're able to respond to grids that are having increasing amounts of renewables and back them up while still uh, sequestering said carbon and allowing for the dynamic changes we're seeing worldwide. So one of the interesting things about net power is not that it only captures carbon, but because it's an oxy fuel system, we also have the ability to generate nitrogen and oxygen, uh, as well as argon, and this is kind of, kind of where some of those value-added chemicals come into play. A lot of our, we'll say, base chemicals, such as urea, such as ammonia, uh, methanol, ethanol, et cetera, are typically generated using carbon-emitting resources, um, uh, like conventional steam methane reforming, uh, et cetera. Well, with this facility, we're able to generate all the electricity and all the chemical feedstocks to make these chemicals and other products. Uh, as a result, we, we expect the first handful of net power plants that are at commercial scale to actually be more economically competitive than standalone fossil emitting um, combined cycle type plants. And that's huge because it gives us a massive learning curve in being able to get this technology deployed in a wide scale. So, you know, my dream is that by the time uh, we've got five or six of these plants up and running, we're hands down able to compete with 
uh, emitting fossil facilities. And that means carbon capture is no longer a moral imperative, it just becomes the economic no-brainer, and it becomes easy regardless of your politics, your uh, political domain, et cetera, this is what you're gonna do. And as we know from the extensive studies that have been done worldwide for, for decades, there are sufficient reserves to cover most of the world's ability to sequester carbon in a sustainable and safe way. So I mentioned earlier, you know, talking about net power, we're building this plan. It's up and running down uh, in southeast Houston. Um, it's very promising. I'm sure you can find information on the internet about, you know, why this matters in terms of carbon-free electricity. But what's more interesting from my perspective is how we also not only enable carbon-free new build um, infrastructure for power, but how do we retrofit? And one of the key things we're able to do with this plant is treat it as a, a clean combined heat and power resource. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the value-added chemicals that we depend on in society come from hydrogen and comparable pathways to steam methane reforming. Well, we can actually make the electricity we need to make these chemicals, and we can provide the heat we need to make this hydrogen for these chemicals without there being any emissions profile. And, that, and that's massive because when you start to look at where most of the emissions come from, in particular the United States, uh, the power sector is not as large as one might expect. It's actually transportation and industrial resources such as uh, concrete, um, let's say olefins manufacturing, et cetera, uh, where you actually get about an equal split across the three sectors. Um, and those sectors don't have the same luxury of being able to implement post-combustion capture technologies that have been predominantly focused towards uh, the kind of chemistries and pressures and temperatures that power plants generate. You know, when you look at a steel facility or a concrete facility, radically different chemistries, radically different temperatures, and they can't handle the changes in operation without there being a disruption to productivity. So we see net power as a combined heat and power resource to creating clean hydrogen that we expect to be less than a dollar per kilogram, all the way as low as 80 cents per kilogram, simply by piggybacking off its recuperative capabilities. And then the reason that matters to the people in this room is because we actually have hydrogen turbine capabilities. Uh, the vast majority of new turbines in the world can burn hydrogen directly. The problem is cost. Natural gas is cheaper. You gotta get hydrogen down to a cost point where it makes economic sense to run your facility that way. And we think with our clean combined heat and power integration, we can actually not only take natural gas as a raw input, we can then turn that natural gas and its resources into clean hydrogen to help retrofit the rest of the world. And this, this is potentially a game changer because uh, all the major OEMs already own this technology. They're simply waiting for somebody to give them the cheap fuel feedstock. And the hydrogen economy has been you know, promised for, for decades. This is something that's been kicked around. But the answer always is, is it clean and is it cheap? And as you can see right here on this slide, the answer has always been no, you get one or the other. And we really do think if we can get down to below a dollar per kilogram, and even further with uh, feedstocks such as sour gas, um, which is, this thing doesn't wanna go. <laughs> Uh, such as sour gas, we can get it down to about 35 cents per kilogram. At these kinds of price points, you're looking at a world that now can create hydrogen as a transportation fuel through methanol. You're looking at hydrogen that uh, can be used directly for, for burning. So net power is not only a, a new build solution for replacing combined cycle systems that potentially are going to emit and also generating all these industrial gases that have economic value. It's also a platform that becomes the anchor tenant for retrofitting and supplying low cost hydrogen um, through some of the proprietary technologies for heat integration we've created that will allow us to decarbonize the existing fleet. Um, so while this, this is exciting from our standpoint, we actually look at net power in the hydrogen economy and air capture and renewables all working in tandem because they all serve different, this thing's not working, they all serve different functions as to where they fit into this hydrogen economy. You know, if you've got 
CO2 that's being air captured, you're helping offset the existing fossil fleet that then allows you to go into resources like methanol, where renewable energy is creating the hydrogen that goes into that, and you become a carbon neutral transportation fuel generator. If you're using that power, we're helping to create the hydrogen that allows you to create the ammonia for chemicals that are required for things like urea production. Um, so we really do see the future of the world being, or the future of carbon being managed. And it's really an all of the above uh, approach where renewables, direct air capture, and clean fossil team up to really supplement one another and improve upon each other's capabilities. And one of the things that you know we've really been looking at recently is if you're a combined heat and power facility that's able to generate hydrogen, why can't you work with direct air capture? So I think in the future, you'll be hearing from Net Power discussing how we can facilitate corporations such as Carbon Engineering for uh, even improved economics that makes, makes, makes it a no-brainer that uh, carbon management from the viewpoint of sequestering CO2 from fossil fuels and capturing existing emissions becomes the way we actually operate our grid. Oh, thank you. Good evening. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, back here at my alma mater, uh, where I got my MBA just a few years ago. And, um, you know, when I was, uh, you know, considering uh, what I was going to talk about today, I, um, you know, it just came to mind how, how amazed I am, constantly amazed I am by human ingenuity. It, you know, there, there always is some new technology coming along or some new method or some new way of, of just bettering, you know, our ways of life. And we, we see that across all the, um, you know, all different kinds of industries, uh, uh, medicine and, and healthcare and, and transportation. And of course, we certainly see that in the energy uh, sector. And, and we, we have a, these gentlemen here represent a couple of different uh, ways of, of bringing that human in ingenuity into technology and uh, working to improve uh, how we get our energy. And, and, and that's an amazing thing. But uh, before we, we talk about carbon management and, and how that goes, I'd like to step back a little bit from, from that. The, the, the base assumption that we have uh, here, I think, is mainly that uh, we need carbon management. And, and I'd, I'd just like to st take a step back and kind of look at you know, the, some of those assumptions that are going into that. And, and so I'd like to start off kind of putting that in the context of, of what I, I would characterize as a, um, a long-term attack on, um, on, uh, on carbon, right? a, a war on carbon. And, and that, that's been going on for um, a, a long time. It, and it goes back as far as even if you go back to the uh, uh, England in the in the 12 and 1300s, uh, there were, there was a uh, there was a war on carbon. Uh, the the poor, poor people started burning um, what they called sea coal back in those days because they were cold and they needed heat, and the 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 uh, nobility had a, a monopoly on the forest, and so the, the poor <coughs> folks couldn't get. Um, get hold of the, the wood to keep themselves warm and cook their food and those kind of things. And, uh, but of course, the sea coal, when it was burned, uh, created uh, air pollution and uh, the nobility didn't like it. So they banned the use of sea coal. They even put a, uh, the death penalty on it. And, um, and when, when, when we talk about this war on carbon, from that perspective, I think we see that, that oftentimes it's not just a war on carbon, but it's been a war on prosperity. Uh, cheap. Uh, affordable and reliable uh, energy has has greatly contributed to human prosperity over the years, and um, and when we make energy more expensive, as we have been doing over the last um, 40 years or so, uh, we, we see prosperity drop off. Um, when we when we think about renewable energy and 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 those types of things, we have to remember that renewable energy was. Um, had 100% market share for most of human history. When you talk, talk about water and wind and air and biomass or, or wood, um, but then in about two to 300 years ago, uh, that market share started dropping and it dropped to near zero, except where water is very abundant, like the Pacific Northwest. And it, and it went to that for one simple reason because 
Uh, Carbon-based technologies are, are more efficient and they're more reliable and they, and they produce more abundant and uh, affordable fuels. And, and people have it, let me go back here, and, and so the, the attack on, on carbon-based fuels has really kind of come in three different areas. One is air quality. Uh, people said, well, we need to reduce our use because of air quality. Two, because we're running out of carbon-based fuels. And three, because of more recently global warming. And, um, and, and I'd suggest that all three of those in, in some form or fashion have moved from, from sometimes r realistic and uh, needs up front to towards failure in their ultimate way we look at them. And I'd like just to hit a few points of those right here. So America today has some of the cleanest and healthiest air in the entire country. Um, it, it, it's just amazing when you look at what goes on. And of course, back in the 1960s, when we first had the Clean Air Act, that wasn't the case. Um, we, we needed to do something about our air. Of course, the private market sector had already been moving in that direction. Um, but government stepped in and brought some regulations on that as well. But today we look at the air and, and we see that, um, you know, for instance, when it comes to particulate matter, 2.5, uh, we see that you can see the, the air quality in America is better than almost the entire world, except for some of England. I mean, the, the European states and things like that, we're, we're equal with those. We just have very clean air when it comes to particulate matter. Uh, we've had an amazing success over the last 30 to 40 years in reducing our ambient concentrations of, of what you might call criteria pollutants. That's from 1990 to 2017. All of them are going down, uh, and, almost, and all of them are at or below uh, the, uh, the, the criteria that's set by the EPA. And then we've done all that, and you can see down here, uh, if you combine all those together, that bottom line down there is the reduction overall in these criteria pollutants. But we've done all that at the same time while we've been increasing our economic prosperity. Right? Um, it just economic growth goes, goes up uh, and, and the um, air quality uh, continues to increase too as particulates go down and those types of things. So efforts today to say, well, we've got to stop using carbon because it's destroying our air just aren't true. And, and we've progressed from you know, a real need to what we, I would call failure. Uh, of course, the second uh, attack on carbon-based fuel has been at one time started when they said we we're gonna run out of carbon-based fuel. You can see here from the Club of Rome uh, back in the uh, 19, uh, 1994 Oh, no, 1970s, they were saying that we're going to run out of uh, all these resources. We're going to run out of uh, oil and natural gas by 1994. We're going to run out of a lot of other uh, of these um, chem minerals that we really need. But of course, nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, we've, we don't have it run out. In fact, uh, we've um, uh, vastly increased our resources. Here's oil reserves that uh, were very high in the past and have gone down, but we're, we're skyrocketing now because of new technologies and we're getting ready to set an all-time high in oil, in oil reserves. Natural gas production has reached an all-time high. So clearly, um, unlike clean air, which was an, indeed something we needed to address, there's never been a problem about whether or not we're gonna run out of, um, of uh, uh, mineral sources of energy, carbon-based sources of energy. And finally, it comes to the, um, the, uh, the, the, the question of uh, carbon uh, management and global warming and, and climate change. Um, today's temperatures are within historical norms. Uh, you, know, you saw a slide earlier that showed um, how the temperature had increased over the last so many years. I think it's within this century or so. But if you go back uh, to, to um, uh, this side of um, you know about 2,000 years or so, you, you see that temperature has always had very great natural variability, and we're we're in that realm today. Uh, I'm not saying that CO2 emissions and, and humans haven't had contributed to that, but it's um, not like we are outside of historical norms on that. Um, here here's just a just a graph to show that how how much CO2 is actually in the air, uh, not very much. It, it's a very small bit of the, CO, of, of the overall part of the atmosphere. 
and what we put into the atmosphere, CO2, is even much smaller than that, of course. Um, the um, emissions of CO2 are declining uh, today, at least in the developed world, and the, uh, the United States is, is actually leading in that, and we're leading in that even though we don't have any CO2 emission limits uh, like uh, in most of the rest of the developed world has. And we're doing it because the market is recognizing this, that it's a concern to citizens, whether or not it's, it, you know, whatever citizen, citizens could be right, they could be wrong, but, but they're recognized, the market has recognized that people are concerned about it and they're responding to that. And, and finally, I'd just like to point out that, and, so it, it could, I think the jury is still out about anthropomorphic CO2 induced um, climate change. Uh, it, it, I think it, it very well could be the case. Uh, it possibly could not be the case. But, uh, but the models we have today clearly don't, are not capturing what is going on in the atmosphere today. Uh, the, the model, CO2 models we have today are heading towards failure. And you can see uh, the red line there is the projection of where these, the, uh, all the CO2 models brought together would take us, and, and you can see where the temperatures actually have been over the last uh, few years. So, um, so while it might be a debate about how much we are contributing to um, uh, climate change as humans, what's not debatable is that the climate models aren't capturing that in a way that helps us move forward in this process. So I, I'd like to point out that managing uh, carbon is really managing prosperity and that we and there's three ways really that we're, we're kind of looking at managing carbon today and I'm going to expand the definition it's not just like cap capture or pulling it out of the air or capture it while we're generating it it's a little bit broader than that I, I would say we can tax co2 emissions that's one way that's going on uh, we can mandate co2 emission reductions or we can subsidize carbon management like we're talking today, and we do that through tax credits and other kinds of things. But I'd suggest all those things harm prosperity um, because they wind up, rather than the market determining what is the best path fo forward, uh, we see a misallocation of resources, we see reduced economic growth, fewer jobs, and, and a s significant transfer of wealth between the poor and the average citizens in our country and other places, not just from our country, but from less developed countries, and, and to, to wealthy parts of the economy, uh, shareholders of, uh, of large corporations and, and those types of things. It's a, it's a significant harm to economic growth. So, so I'll wrap up here by saying that, but I think we should end the war on carbon by letting the market work. Whether or not we need to address carbon management and emissions and those kinds of things, there's a mechanism for moving forward on that. But it's not with the government intervention in things. We, we need to get rid of these uh, mandates, taxes, and subsidies for carbon management. Uh, you can see that, um, so for instance, one of the ways that was recently proposed to, to, to take on carbon emissions, CO2 emissions, was the clean power plan just in one portion of it alone, the energy efficiency portion of it, it would have cost uh, Americans $100 billion through 2029. And that's $100 billion added to our electricity bills. Uh, carbon capture, if there's lots of different ways to estimate what that would cost in terms of the uh, tax credit. But if we go to where people are, are uh, talking about uh, heading, it could cost us at least $2 billion a year to do carbon capture technologies. Electric cars, um, the current tax credits you get for electric cars uh, will run, continue running through and cost $7.5 billion. And, and renewable energy subsidies uh, for the production tax credit in particular uh, for wind and, um, and, and solar are, are going to run about $70 billion through 2029. This is a tremendous tax on prosperity. It's a tremendous tax on the poor. And I'd suggest it's, it's a, a, a tax we don't need, a cost we don't need. Because a lot of people would say the market has failed when it comes to CO2, but, I, but again, I, I think that's just not the case. Um, I, what are alleged to be these externalities that are not being captured are actually 
captured, but only when they're appropriate. The market looks at these things and says, okay, people care about this, we need to react to this, and they price it into their product, and, and they move forward, and that's why we've seen such a reduction in CO2 emissions in the United States. So the, the, if we need to manage carbon, the market will recognize it, and they'll invest capital in a way that is efficient and is geared towards prosperity uh, rather than poverty. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, time for our second round and to see if John can redeem himself. <laughs> so, uh, can we have the... Uh... There we go. There's the code again. 747-7904. And I believe you're going to have to enter your numbers again, it looks like. Do we need to have everyone enter the numbers again? Yeah, yeah so please go ahead, because right now we have zero players listed. <laughs> Which means if one person enters, you're guaranteed to win. <laughs> John hacked the system. I think they're trying again, just one second. It's, oh, a new, yeah, a new number. 2443308. Hello, Iggy. Here's John. Revenge the This is when we find out John's playing remotely from Moscow. Wow, we have more than we originally did. Okay, so are you ready? Question number one. Which of the following is a method of carbon management? Carbon capture sequestration, cap and trade, negative emissions technologies, or the ever popular all of the above? And all of the above wins. And Dre at the top. When did the Club of Rome project project oil and natural gas to be depleted by? 1934, 1988, 1994, or 2014? And virtually everyone got that. The time under the wire. At 50, <laughs> oh. And Um Petro is on top. John is working his way back up the rankings again. Hang in there. What are three ways to force carbon management according to Peacock? Tax CO2 emissions, mandate CO2 emission reductions, subsidize carbon management, or all of the above? All of the above. And virtually all of you got that one. And we're slowly creeping up. Four or five, which sector contributes the most to direct anthropogenic emissions? Energy, industry, residential and commercial buildings, or transport? And the answer is energy. Interesting, most of you thought it was transport. But AD nailed it. According to Forrest, which, um, what industries will develop the CO2 economy help develop? Sour gas cleanup, water treatment, enhanced oil recovery, or all of the above. And I think you're all discovering that when the answer is all of the above, that's a good one to go with. <laughs> and our winner is Alexander. I thought Oh Petroleum was going to get it there for a while. <laughs> all right. So if both of you will come up at the end, we can claim your prizes. Thank you. So I think we're going to open it up to Q&A now. Um, and we have a lot of questions coming in. If people have additional questions, um, just submit them via the website and we will try to get to them. Um, the first thing I want to ask is really for you two. Um, 
around, you both said that these are kind of proven technologies, you've got working systems, um, but we know we need to scale up these technologies really quickly. So the IPCC report says around 2050 for net zero and then moving to net negative. Um, what's the time frame for scaling up your respective systems? Uh, real for you need to turn your mic on. Down here. On the earth. Okay, just talk loud, I guess. Um, for net power, realistically, we expect in two to three years, the technology should be at a point in terms of manufacturing and construction to be able to deploy uh, grid level solutions. I think the real question is, is just the rate of building those plants because they are new builds. You're not gonna be able to replace the entire fossil fleet. And that's kind of why I brought up the whole hydrogen economy aspect because that can be done much more quickly in terms of retrofits than new builds from the ground up across the board. So all the technology for our commercial scale um, equipment exists. Uh, I could literally write a PO and go get the equipment with the exception of the combustion turbine, which is something we have been developing for several years with Toshiba. And that's in the final stages of development for commercial units. So the, the, answer is as, the answer is as fast as you can build it. Yes. Okay. Um, it sounds like my microphone's working. You keep that one. Uh, so pretty much the same answer for us, actually. Uh, because we use technology used in other industries, we don't have the equivalent of your combustion device. Each piece of equipment is readily purchasable. So frankly, it's, it's just driven by economics and customers. And if the value proposition for either the fuel or for EOR makes sense today, and we think it does, um, we're confident we can scale quickly. Um, we've been asked repeatedly, how many of your plants would offset the entire um, emissions of the world? And uh, so the answer is about 40,000. And you, know, you may think that's a ridiculous number, but equally it's not a ridiculous number. That's less than there are power plants in the world, for example. Um, we would never propose that you rely on one solution for something as important as decarbonization. Um, but it's not entirely unfeasible. All right, so you mentioned that cost is somewhat of a limiting factor for, at the moment. And we've had a lot of questions about the economics of these sure. technologies. That's something that Bill also brought up in his presentation. You know, the technologies are um, supported through subsidies, as are a raft of other, really basically every other source of energy we have in this country, um, both renewables and fossil fuels. So I wonder if you two can speak a little to the um, sort of economics with and without subsidies. And um, Bill, if you want to jump in and um, sort of reflect on, on what they say. I'll go first this time, um, just for variety. Uh, so firstly, on, on subsidies. So. Uh, so I'm a believer that market-based incentives are there to try and shape future economies for issues that are of significance that affect a, uh, an entire country. Um, subsidies or incentives should be, by definition, a short-term process. They should help industries get over the hump of initial implementation. The challenge we face right now with our business is we have a pilot plant. We have very cost-effective economics for full plants, but who wants to build the first plant? Everybody wants to build the second or third. Go get, retire all the risk with some other guy, <laughs> and then when that's all done, we'll come in and, and build a plant. So that's a great example of where incentives can make a significant difference to enable a technology that's seen as having long-term value get to market. But here is where I actually agree with Bill entirely. Um, these incentives, there's no point having incentives if the end economics doesn't work. The incentives have to uh, fit into an economic system. So for example, the production of our fuel sat today, we're about 20% more uh, cost than fossil fuel. And my guess is if you guys drove to the pump tomorrow and our fuel was there on one pump and next door was regular fuel, our fuel was completely carbon neutral, but 20% more expensive, everybody's gonna buy this one. That's just human nature. So we have to retire that 20% of cost. We have a plan to do so. And by the time we've done so, we'll expect the incentive programs will have disappeared uh, and will be cost competitive. 
I think from our perspective, we were somewhat cynical when we first started developing NetPower. We were developing a technology for a US-based market where we saw climate change as a problem, but we didn't expect there to be any government assistance or any, any, any kind of supplementation whatsoever. And um, honestly, we, we have had very limited to no assistance from government um, for the development of our plant in Texas, uh, in Southeast Texas. So we've always said from day one, we've gotta be able to compete head to head with technology that's 30 years older than us. And we've gotta be able to stand on our own merits as far as being able to sell electricity into a grid that is wide open and, and dynamic in terms of costs. Now, we're not silly. We've also looked at the fact that we can sell the CO2 to EOR uh, organizations. We've got all these other industrial gases. And we've always looked at that as helping us get up the learning curve so that we uh, have a return on investment that you know should exceed significantly what a standalone power plant that doesn't do anything to produce electricity is capable of achieving. So that's how we kind of looked at it was we got to go head to head. It's just got to be being environmentally responsible is also being financially responsible. And that's kind of the direction we've taken. Now, I'm not opposed to um, government supplementation in terms of helping getting you over that learning curve. Uh, but as was just mentioned, it, it has to have a timeline, otherwise your technology's failed. It's gotta be able to work within the construct of the way a, a market behaves, because otherwise you're trying to radically change culture, which I actually think is more difficult than solving the science and engineering problem itself. Yeah, I think when it, when it comes to looking at the role of subsidies, I, I tend to have seen in my experience that subsidies don't bring innovation to the market. They, they, they keep um, technologies that aren't going to work in business longer. Uh, we, we, we've seen that in, in, in multiple ways here in Texas. Uh, for instance, uh, wind subsidies. You know, we, we've had the production tax credit in, in place now for over 20 years. And, um, and still, wind and solar both haven't caught up with the uh, cost of producing electricity from natural gas or, or coal or, or even nuclear. And, uh, and the subsidies on a per megawatt hour are significantly more for renewable fuels today or renewable production generation than they are. For instance, uh, coal and natural gas get about 64 cents per megawatt worth of subsidies. Uh, wind is up in the $20, and then uh, solar is multiple times past that. But we also see this going on in, in conventional, uh, the problems with subsidies in conventional fuels. Uh, you, you look up in PJM, which is the uh, electric grid uh, around Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and and, and that up in that area up there. They're giving subsidies to coal and natural gas uh, based uh, generators. Here in Texas, the, the generators in coal and nuclear and natural gas just came to the Texas Public Utility Commission about three weeks ago and asked for four billion dollars a year electricity tax. That, that's not going to do anything to improve the environment or anything else. It, you know, it, it may be a good thing to generate electricity from those things, but what we don't need to do is maintain old outdated plants by government subsidies. And I, I'd say that goes for, for coal or wind or anything else. And as far as carbon capture go, technology goes, I, I think the market will let it work if it will work, and, and subsidies aren't going to get them over the hump. Okay, let's talk about the carbon tax point. You made the point in your presentation that you know carbon is often described as an externality and we know it's not priced in the market um, currently. And uh, Steve, from what you were saying, you know, you were making the point that if someone pulls up and gas is more expensive from one source than another, they're gonna choose the cheapest source. But if we're not factoring in those carbon externalities, that's not really an equal choice. So. Does this mean we need a carbon tax? And Bill, I know you're probably going to say no. So what is your opposition to a carbon tax? And let's start with Steve. Um, you know, I, so I'm not the policymaker. It's, it's not my job to figure out what the best way to 
um, enable the technologies that we require to develop is. Um, I, you know, what I will say is this. I think you know, we have many, many, many climate scientists who are telling us that we need to reduce CO2 emissions. So assuming that to be the case, the real key enabler, and again, I, I, this is where, again, I agree with Bill, the real key enabler is you, the general public. Because if the general public believes that climate change is an issue and we have to do something about it, then the pressure on governments to produce some form of carbon pricing in one mechanism or another, and there's many different models around the world, and the pressure on companies to adjust um, to become, for example, the first carbon neutral energy company in the world. If you were able to tell your shareholders and the general public you're the first carbon neutral energy company in the world, my guess is you're going to do well for a, as a company. So to me, the education is to the general public, um, and the general public will assess whether or not carbon is a critical issue. You know, I look at the, the, the numbers for 2100 scare me. We can't afford to be wrong. You know, if we get to 2080 as a species and say, God, we were wrong, we should listen to those crazy guys <laughs> on that panel back in 2018, um, <laughs> it's too late. We can't take that risk. You know, this is my grandkids, it's your grandkids we're talking about living in that world. So my view is educate the public Guys like you coming out to listen to people like us talking today will create the market incentives and the pressure on companies. And whether that turns into a carbon tax or, as Bill describes, the entrepreneurial spirit and the capitalistic spirit that the US and many other nations have, uh, have developed using, to me, that's, that's, it's, it's all good, whichever way. So believing that climate change is a problem and that it will have moderate to severe effects sometime in the future, I think uh, some sort of pressure does have to be applied. The question is whether you go the carrot or the stick approach. I think carbon taxes more often than not are viewed as the stick approach. And anyone who's taken an intro psych course in college knows that the carrot almost always works better for motivating people. And we're seeing that in our own business where you know, a lot of energy companies are worried about being future proof because they're worried about the future stick. But we're able to convince them we're A, gonna be exactly the same cost as that new build you're gonna go with anyways, and B, with the industrial gases you can sell and things like the carrot of 45Q, which is uh, a government tax incentive for sequestering carbon, not a tax, uh, there's a lot of carrot there. And that's generated far more interest. Um, so I think it's, it's there has to be some sort of, we'll say, organized system level uh, nudge, but it has to address human psychology. And I'm more of a fan of the carrot than the stick. Well, I love uh, carrots and sticks, right? It just <laughs> depend on, it depends on what you need. And, and, and I, th I think um, certainly when you talk about a, a carbon tax, I, I think that is in the, falls into the, the uh, stick category. Uh, we, the Texas legislature will be in, uh, they come around every two years here in Texas and they'll be in session in, in early January and they just started filing bills this week and one of the first bills filed was a, a carbon tax here in Texas uh, at uh, about five dollars per uh, million metric tons I think it was. Any, anyway, uh, uh, about 350 million dollars based on uh, CO2 emissions here in Texas. And, uh, and, and I just don't see a reason for imposing that cost on Texans, who, and much less across the United States, to raise the cost of their energy that way. Because I, I suggest, uh, as I alluded to earlier, I don't think we know that CO2 isn't being priced into the, um, into, into the energy prices today. In fact, I would suggest that it is being priced into, uh, into the market because as, as I talked about again, the, the United States is leading the way in reducing CO2, and it's because in a market-based economy, companies respond to their consumers. Unlike when you get over into to Europe, I mean, it, it's carbon management over there and, and, and the way they're doing it over there is nothing but corporate cronyism. And, and you have all these companies fighting over this, this you know, the allocations and, and the cost. and and trying to get the best profit out of the deal. 
they're not really concerned about their customers. They're not really concerned about climate change. They're concerned about making a profit off the money that they can get through the government. And, and unlike in the United States, where it is totally different, where the consumers are put first, and, and it's whether I agree with them or not, uh, people in the United States are concerned about climate change, and, and the market is responding. I think you're right that people are concerned about climate change. I think the reason that um, US emissions have declined by so much is because we have had such a surge in natural gas, as you showed, due to new technologies that have made it so cheap. I don't know that it has a whole lot to do with climate change. But. Well, I, I would say, if you look at where oil prices were when fracking was booming, and you're looking at where NGLs were at the same time, there was a massive financial incentive to go after those resources. Natural gas was a waste product nobody cared about. We happened to accidentally develop a lower carbon source yeah, fuel exactly. than coal, <laughs> and we just bottomed out the gas prices. And then once uh, you saw OPEC uh, cut production, or actually oversupply and drop oil prices, you saw all that collapse. But they still had the ability to supply natural gas. So I don't know if the market really responded to people wanting lower carbon yeah. resources. I think the market responded towards people wanting oil and NGLs. And, At we, low we got prices. The, and we got this waste product that happened to cover our butts in terms of being able to decarbonize. So like, I, I agree the market does respond, um, but the market's responding because everybody is getting somewhat panicked. And a lot of the energy companies we're talking about are multinational. So they're having to deal with, you know, their European consumers. So let's say you're an oil and gas company operating in Texas, but you're still exporting product. You're, you're not beholden just to Americans, you're beholden to a, a global citizenry. I, I, I think we're just, in my, my view, we're really blessed with the resources we have in this country. And we're really lucky that we have the flexibility for technology to be implemented as is seen fit. But I don't want to count on luck. That's kind of how I look at it. All right, well, let's shift our focus a little bit. Um, and we've had a lot of questions about hydrogen, which both Steve and Brooke mentioned. Um, you know, this idea of the hydrogen economy and hydrogen replacing various other fuels that we currently rely on has been around um, for years and has never really gone anywhere. Um, my understanding is because of the sort of challenges involved in using hydrogen, transporting it, things like that. What do you see for the future of hydrogen? How are we going to overcome those sorts of issues? Go ahead. Um, so it's kind of a twofer. So the first is clearly transporting hydrogen. It's not really feasible on the global scale in terms of liquefying it, compressing it, putting in ships like, like LNG. But what is possible and easier than shipping LNG is shipping a lot of these hydrogen derivatives like ammonia and methanol. And the nice part about these products are that the ships that are typically used actually have a, there's a greater number of ports globally that can support uh, these types of vessels and you're not dealing with the same infrastructure costs. So let's say you're in Sub-Saharan Africa and you're importing liquid diesel fuel for recip engines to, to, to power your grid. That same port can handle hydrogen technologies like this. Um, but the second part is, so great, we can get the hydrogen on shore, how do you decarbonize it? How do you deal with it when you get there? Because there's no point if you just make methanol and the CO2 goes back up into the atmosphere. Um, there's actually been a number of breakthroughs that have been made in things like uh, low temperature reforming catalysts. In particular, China has been pushing this uh, very strongly with their Belt and Road Initiative, um, looking to export methanol from uh, natural gas resource rich nations such as the United States um, because it's much cheaper and easier to get methanol throughout the country's ports than it is through large LNG terminals. And I think that's kind of where the future of a hydrogen economy is looking at uh, carriers. Like, let's stop trying to think about creating the giant uh, 700 bar pressure containment. It, it, it's not sensical from an engineering standpoint, from a cost standpoint. Um, but also looking for these breakthroughs, like once you get that liquid fuel there, uh, how do you deal with the carbon? And like, do you take the, reform it there, put the CO2 in an LPG tanker, which can easily handle CO2, ship it to Texas for EOR. So now you actually pay for the cost of your reforming catalyst to use hydrogen. And if you're an economy like South Korea or Japan, uh, that helps defer your costs of LNG imports. I'll make a quick comment on this. So um, you know, one of the challenges we have with climate change is it's everybody's problem on the globe. Therefore, it's nobody's problem. 
know, why should I spend money to fix the problem if Nation XYZ isn't doing anything about it? So I believe, we believe at Carbon Engineering, the solution for this is to have non-disruptive ways of disrupting the economy and disrupting the way we work. So a liquid fuel is a non-disruptive way of all the economies in the world that use fuel. And you go to anywhere in the world, you'll find a car, you'll find a gas station. We have a liquid fuel infrastructure already around the globe. Liquid fuel is a tremendously energy efficient way of transporting energy. So our position is, you know, hydrogen, electric, uh, electrification of transportation is a massive infrastructure change, which will take many, many years and trillions and trillions of dollars. So try find a solution that doesn't require that degree of change. Uh, and changing the fuel um, is a way of doing that. Blending the fuel with existing fuels from the fossil fuel industry is a way that you can ensure that we, uh, we can bring that product to market straight away. We can make our fossil fuels last longer and longer and longer and buy ourselves the time to address the negative emissions that we need to make. All right, we are almost out of time, so um, we will, I'll give you each just a minute or two to give some closing remarks. And perhaps uh, you could reflect on sort of what the, what the future holds for these technologies and how they should and can intera interact with other approaches that we take to address climate change. So whether they be regulatory, whether they be other sort of market-driven solutions, um, just sort of reflect on the future. Bill, do you want to start? Sure, I'd be happy to. I work in uh, the public policy arena. I I've been doing that since 1989 when I first moved from Houston to Austin. And what, what I've seen over the years is that there's always a crisis ahead of us. Everybody comes to the legislature or to Congress and says this crisis is coming and if you don't do something now, and usually that something is regulate something or spend our tax dollars on something, then the end of the world is coming soon. But the interesting thing is the crisis is always far enough out, far enough out that you, you can't really refute what they're saying, that, that the, something's gonna happen in 15 or 20 or 25 or 30 years. And, and so they, the scenario is set up saying, if you don't do something now, these terrible things are gonna happen in 35 years. Well, nobody really remembers in 35 years uh, what you know, whether or not what they came true, but the money has been spent or the regulations have been put on. You know, it, we've seen that here in, in, in the CO2 and the climate change. The, the models that back in the, in, the, in the 80s and 90s were projecting uh, uh, temperatures much higher today than they actually are. And the, the models just aren't working very well. We, we, we also see that just, you know, because it, it's the nature of people who come up to the legislature and want to, to get money from them. We call it rent seeking. We see that today in the uh, electric market and from the, the coal and oil and I mean the natural gas and nuclear generators coming looking for four billion dollars a year energy tax on us. Uh, but it's not the first time they've come on. The reason for saying they're coming here today because the lights are going to go out in Texas if we don't give them this four billion dollars. But they actually came to the Texas legislature and back in 2011, 12 and 13 and made the exact same case. Uh, and it was, it was, in this case, it was just three or four or five years ahead. Well, those three or four or five years have passed by. We still haven't seen the lights go out in Texas. So, so when we look at these kind of issues, we, we think people should step back, really examine these things, and, and generally let market-based solu market solutions solve these rather than government interventions, which are taking money uh, out of our pockets and giving it to other people. Brock? So... Predicting exactly what's going to happen is to a certain degree a fool's errand because it's almost impossible. You know, as we're trying to figure this out, uh, we're also learning how to figure it out at the same time. So it's learning by doing. Uh, but what I will say is I, I like to use the following analogy. I think cl addressing climate change, whether it be through policy or through entrepreneurship or however, whatever the means are, I think it's a moral question. And the analogy I want to use is, you know, pretend there's two houses on a small island nation about to get hit by a hurricane. One house is made out of concrete, one's made out of sheet metal. You know, us as Americans, we live in the house made out of concrete. We'll be able to weather the storm. We will survive the day. Uh, we will have a mess to clean up. Uh, but do you care about your neighbor? And that's kind of 
where my motivation comes from. And beyond that, you know, I don't want us spending tax dollars in the future on piping water from East Texas to West Texas or from Colorado to California because there are 20 million people who live in a metropolitan area and climate has changed the weather patterns enough that aquifer and water rights no longer exist like they once did 50, 60 years ago when the laws were written. So I think that's kind of what, what we're at risk here in the developed world. It's like, how do we want to spend our money? Do we want to go to space or do we want to build canals? You know, that's really how I look at it from, from the Western luxury standpoint. So it's kind of a moral question. How do you want your, your literal neighbor to be treated and how do you want you know, your neighbor across the world to be treated? Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question to answer in the context of the panel. Um, you know, I, I look at this really, really simply. We just can't afford to be wrong on this. And, and if we're wrong, then, and we haven't done anything, that the impacts on your families, your kids, your grandkids is dramatic. And there's no two ways around that. And you know what, if I'm sat here on this panel 50 years from now, first of all, I'll need a wheelchair. But secondly, <laughs> I would be delighted if we were wrong, because we'll have avoided the problem. That's the fundamental thing. So, you know, the US has developed uh, tremendously, and, and the, the rise in prosperity that, that has happened on this nation has been because it's been at the forefront of technical innovation. Whether that was innovation in the past of bringing fossil fuels out of the ground, whether it's the Silicon Valley innovations of the last 20 years, or whether it's the carbon economy that I assert will become a key part of the next 20 years. My view, let's go and use capitalism at its best. Let's produce that technology. Let's dominate that market. Let's get wealthy on the products. And if we happen to save the planet at the same time, fantastic. If we were wrong, <laughs> case there are. Please join me in thanking our panelists. So we have um, a reception immediately outside the room. We hope you will all stay for that. And there we go. First of all, uh, let's thank again our panelists and our moderator for a fabulous presentation. <laughs> And as you leave, two thoughts. I wanted to remind everyone that we have two more energy symposia coming up. Our next one is on natural gas, uh, global fuel or landlocked asset. Which should be interesting. There's, you, they're reading some fascinating work about floating LNG plants and how they might actually unlock some stranded assets. And then our last panel uh, will be discussing uh, wind energy offshore in Texas, which has been a, an interesting perennial issue. We hope to see you there. The second thought, uh, as Romani mentioned, there is food awaiting you outside. <laughs> so uh, please enjoy. We look forward to conversation. Our panelists will be available if you would like to talk with them at, at the reception. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you. <laughs>